Let's try it again. Good morning, Central. That's much better. I heard all you talking, and just your group talking was better than the first one. So well done. Good job. We are happy you are here. Glad to have you. I see some new faces that I haven't seen before. And so we're excited that you have come to be a part of our service together as, as we worship our Creator. Uh, we're doing things just a little different because if you read in your program last week, we have a huge announcement. And uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. But in the meantime, we got a few other announcements. And so uh, we'll want to call your attention to your program. Hopefully you got one of those when you came in. Uh, please uh, pick one up if you didn't. Um, the other thing I forgot is, please, first thing is, we want to connect with you. And so if you would fill out one of these connect cards, it's in the pew in front of you in that little tray there. Fill that out. Place that in your offering plate. When that time of the service comes, that would be great so that we know you've been here and we can try to connect and reach out to you. Um, back to the pro announcements. One of the main announcements is we're not doing much this week. It's Thanksgiving week, and so our Wednesday night programs are uh, put aside so that you can spend time with uh, those around you, those that you cherish, and maybe some you don't cherish, but uh, spend time with your families. And uh, our prayers with you is some of you will be traveling, and you'll have tr families traveling in, so keep that in mind in your uh, prayer times this week, and we encourage you to uh, take part in those festive meals, but don't eat too much bread. <laughs> He's already in a turkey coma, I think. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, one of the other announcements we want to call your attention to is that the care packages that are out in the hot lobby, we do that often to encourage our college students, and they're out there again. Uh, but uh, time is short, okay? Those have to be mailed out by December 4th so that they get to the college students before Christmas break. And so if you want to put a note in there to encourage them, if you want to put some non-perishable item in there to encourage them and to maybe give them a sweet tooth as they go through finals and, and those kind of things. Um, please do that, but do that soon, okay? Uh, we're not a lot of time. And the other thing is, is we want you to save the date. Christmas, the, the kids have been practicing already for the Christmas program, our annual Christmas program, and that's going to happen December 10th. Mark that on your calendars. Mark it on your on your phone calendar, like I've, my wife taught me how to use last week. Um, <laughs> it works great, but not so well if you don't know how to use it, right? So that's coming up December 10th. And along the lines of save the date is our huge announcement. And it should not come to any surprise to any of us that the family is under attack. It's an, it is estimated that Bible-believing families throughout the United States are losing 60 to 70 percent of their sons and daughters to secular thinking by the time they reach age 15. It's also estimated that church families are experiencing a 40 percent plus divorce rate. And on top of that, the Christian father, the vital link to the family who was intended to provide headship, identity, and purpose, is vanishing from his God-ordained place of leadership. In short, it's obvious the number one ta target of this attack is the family. And the family, of course, is a key to everything else in society. Central Church of Christ is not unaware of this attack of families, and we know there are even families under the attack that are in attendance right here this morning. We're also aware that the building block of faith and family start in the beginning. As in, in the beginning, God created, Genesis 1.1. We believe the family was established in the beginning and is a fundamental that we understand the importance of Genesis as a foundation of faith and family. It's for this reason that we have invited Matt Miles and the Creation Truth Foundation and his 46-foot enclosed trailer of friends to Garing, Nebraska this coming June. On the week of June 19th through the 15th, we will be hosting VBS and a revival like this congregation in this valley has not experienced before. 
It will include gathering times for young and old alike and for families to, to discover what a difference a biblical worldview makes in their lives. There will be something for everyone to partake in, opportunities for everyone to serve, and it will include the largest collection of dinosaur fossils in the religious world. It is going to be nothing short of something huge. We believe that the God's desire that this VBS and the revival will reach beyond not just the walls of this congregation, but it will reach out into our community with the biblical truth that, God, that the God of the sacred scriptures is our creator and that he is our owner and because he is, only he can set the rules and we, his children, must obediently follow them. It's going to take all of us and the mighty hand of God to see that the week of June 9th has a huge impact in the kingdom of God and in this valley. And I hope you're asking, what can I do? And I'm, and I'm so glad you've asked. The week is far from being ironed out, and there is a lot of work to do in the next six months. There will be many more announcements, meetings, and opportunities, but for now we ask that you mark it on your calendars and pray about three things. The first, pray for our lost world. That is the title of the Vacation Bible School, Our Lost World. It is in reference and a playoff of the Jurassic Park movie, The Lost World. But it is so much more. Pray for our VBS, yes. But also pray for the lost world that we live in. We have the map that will lead them to salvation, and it's up to you and it's up to me to share it. Secondly, pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you in how to, how to consider how you will be an active part of the mission. Kathy Fogel put this up on her uh, Facebook post yesterday, and I thought it was very appropriate. We haven't even made the list, but... We're praying that God will lead you to be part of the solution of who's going to do it. It's up to us to seek and save our lost world. And I believe we have all been gifted with the different talents and creativity that we're supposed to use to spread the good news of salvation only found in Jesus Christ. And no matter what your age is, the week of June is going to be, require all of us to give of our time, our talents, and our treasures. And the prayer is how you personally will be part of seeking our lost world in those three areas. And finally, third, I'd like you to pray for the Creation Truth Foundation as they continue to travel all corners of our nation with the mission that God has called them to. And I think it's a great mission. And that is, the mission is to train disciples you and I, followers of Christ, to trust the Bible's historical accuracy so that we can trust its promises for our destiny. So, in, in, in closing, we want you to save the date, put these on your, on your refrigerator someplace where you will remember it, put your dates in the calendar as you look forward to the new year. We know January's coming and we've got to flip the calendar, right? So, so put, it, put these dates and then pray for those three areas. Pray for our lost world, pray for where you might be a part, and pray for the Creation Truth Foundation. And uh, as we look forward to this huge opportunity to spread the good news to our, our community. like a lot of fun.
I think it looks awesome. It should be a really good time. Thank Mike for arranging that and getting it brought to Gearing. So we're thankful for that. Let's be standing this morning as we begin our time of praise together. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our time of singing. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just we are so thankful, Lord, that we know that you are the creator of the world. We know that all things came from you, and we just are so thankful, Father, that we can gather together in your name and through your power. We just pray that you'd be with each one here this morning, Father, that you'd just open our hearts and our minds to your leading, Father, and just accept our praise to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You're making your way back to your seats this morning. We're going to continue singing, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord.
You may be seated. The next song is a beautiful, beautiful song. Pay attention to the words. Beautiful. At this time, the We Worship can be dismissed, and then all of the kids practicing for the Christmas program need to meet back in the other room back there for Christmas practice. So if you all want to head out.
Looking forward to that. All the kids do a great job on the Christmas program. It's a lot of fun. All right, as we kind of head toward a time of silent prayer this morning, um, lots of people need our prayers, uh, lots of health issues going on. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything real new, but if anybody has anything that uh, hasn't been made known prior or uh, would even a, a, a silent prayer that you would just like mention to somebody. All right. If nothing else, then let's go to the Lord in time of silent prayer this morning, and I'll close. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just... We are so grateful, Lord, that you are there, that you hear our every thought, our every, our every murmur. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are a big enough God to answer any question that we have and to just be there to help with any situation. We just thank you so much for your healing power, Lord. Just pray for all those in the congregation who are having trouble with uh, physical ailments, Lord, that you and your infinite wisdom would just be the help that they need, Lord. Just pray, Father, truly for our nation that uh, you would make more people aware of you and that you are the only solution that's going to fix us. Just pray for the kids as they practice. Just pray for the time that we'll have together through the holidays and we just pray for this time of thanksgiving lord knowing that all good things come from you father and that all thanks go to you and uh, we just are so thankful for that we're thankful father for this congregation for the love and the fellowship that is shared here through you father and just ask that you'd continue to be with us through this time together this morning in christ's name i pray so we turn towards our communion time. Beautiful old hymn, Burden Certificate of Calvary. Eternal Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is more than an annual holiday. For Christ followers, it's a vital spiritual discipline. And Jesus often modeled giving thanks for us. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus thanks the, thanked the Father for hearing him in John 11. And before he fed the 4,000, 
He gave thanks for what was available to him, seven loaves and a few small fish in Mark chapter 8. Jesus lived a life of thanksgiving for the big as well as the small blessings. And the early church followed Jesus' example. The apostle wrote, Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Don't miss the words, with thanksgiving. Giving thanks is an attitude that is to be part of our lives. And we need to live with this attitude. Instead of the worry, we can be thankful because we trust in an all-powerful God in every situation and in every circumstance of life. The word thanksgiving in Philippians 4, 6 is also used in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The word used in both cases is a form of the Greek word, Eucharist us. I'm not a Greek theologist. Does it sound familiar? Eucharist literally means giving thanks or gratitude. Eucharist became the word believers sometime before A.D. 100 used for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And this is incredibly significant. As followers of Christ, we gather together every week to give thanks for, for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which brought us eternal life with him. Thanksgiving, Eucharistos, is an act of worship. Worship is more than something we do in the building once a week. It's part of who we are and whose we are as Christ's followers. As we take this bread and this cup, reminders of Jesus' crucified body and shed blood, we do so with eternal thanksgiving and with an abiding worship. Father God, you are the Almighty, the creator of everything, including us. And Father, we are grateful, thankful for this opportunity that we have to come into this place and to worship you and to give thanks and to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, his death, his burial, and the resurrection that gives us life eternal, the hope of life eternal with you. Father, as we go about our week, this week we often set aside one day to give you thanks, but as Christians, may we give you thanks in every circumstance of our life, in the small and in the big. Thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Good morning. Uh, there was a man who wanted to take up farming to make a living. So he went out and bought a hundred acres of land, gathered all the to- tools he needed to farm, uh, bought a brand new tractor, even a hat, and a nice pair of overalls. And he said to himself, all right, I'm ready to go. So he went out. Uh, he got up the next morning and ate, had a nice breakfast, put on his hat, and went outside and sat on the porch and just stared at his land all day long. The next day, he did the same thing. Then the next day, and even the next day, this continued, the process continued for weeks until the man was confused and went out and was checking the ground for even the smallest sign of growth. But there, there was nothing. The obvious reason is the man hadn't planted any seed. Natural laws dictate that the seed is not planted. Nothing will sprout. He can, he can have all the tools look the part, and even call himself a farmer. But until, Jesus, uh, but until the seed is planted there, there will be no return. In Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 32, Jesus tells a couple of parables on this subject. He said, The kingdom of heaven is, uh, the kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground, and he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts, the sickle, uh, puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can, the, can we compare the kingdom of heaven? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown, becomes larger than, any, than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in the shade. Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a man scattering seed. We cannot expect a harvest without first sowing the seed. The, harvest in, uh, the farmer in this story you know, us being from a farming community, you know, that was pretty, pretty ridiculous that, that you can expect something from not doing the work. Uh, you have to, you have to, uh, to be a fool to do what he did and expect a return. The same goes with the spiritual law. Jesus said, by faith, the farmer scatters the seed, and when the harvest comes, he is in ex- expectation and is prepared to receive it. If we plant a seed in God's kingdom, we can expect without a shadow of a doubt that there will be a returning harvest. Father, we just thank you for this day that you've given us. Uh, We thank you for another day of life. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace that you give us, Father. And uh, we just ask that you bless the gift and also the giver. And uh, may we do it with uh, thanksgiving in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Someone has uh, written a little piece titled The Prodigal Son in the Key of F. You all, you all know The Prodigal Son? You, most of you, many of you, some of you, I don't know. Prodigal Son is uh, found in Luke 15, verses 1 through 
verse 11. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just, uh, just remind you that parable. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, For, Father, give me the share of my estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them, and he went, ran off and squandered his wealth. And, and so, um, and, and then he returned. He came to a sense as he returned. The father, you know, killed the fatty calf. We had a big party for this one that was lost has, has come home. Well, that's the, that's the parable, but somebody put that parable, parable in the key of F, and I want to just share that uh, parable, and it's uh, not necessarily the direction I'm going with this sermon, but it, uh, it kind of just gives us a little humorous piece to begin, but then I'm going to preach another uh, message on another word in the key of F, which is always faithful. But here's the prodigal son in the key of F. Ready? I don't know if I can do this or not. This is going to take a lot of wind. Feeling footloose and frisky. See the key of F. A feather-brained fellow forced his fond father to fork over his farthings. He flew far to foreign fields and frittered his fortune, feasting fabulously with faithless friends. Finally, facing famine and fleeced by his fellows in folly, he found himself a feed flinger in a filthy farmyard. Fairly famished, he fain would have filled his frame with foraged food from the fodder fragments. Fooey, my father's flunkies fare far fancier, the frazzled fugitive fumed feverishly, frankly facing facts. Frustrated by failure and filled with foreboding, he fled forthwith to his family. Falling at his father's feet, he floundered forlornly, Father, I have flunked and fruitlessly forfeited family favor. But the faithful father, forestalling further flinching, frantically flagged the flunkies, to fetch forth the finest fatling and fix a feast. The fugitive's fraternal fault finder frowned on the fickle forgiveness of former Falderal. His fury flashed, but fussing was futile. The far-sighted father figured, such filial fidelity is fine, but what forbids fervent festivity for the fugitive is found. Unfurl the flags, let fanfares flare, let fun and frolic freely flow. Former failure is forgotten, folly forsaken. Father's forgiveness forms the foundation for former fugitives' future fortitude. The end. The prodigal son in the key of F. I don't know about you, but uh, last weekend we had a speaker here by the name of Victor Knowles, and Victor Knowles preached Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and uh, he stayed on the topic of faithfulness. Um, he talked about God's faithfulness, and he challenged us to uh, challenge us through His Word to be faithful in all that we do. And, um, and so I want to, this morning I'm going to be gleaning a few things from Victor's book. Victor had a, well he had lots of books out in the foyer if you remember his table, but he had a book that was entitled Forever Faithful and that was hot off the press. That had just been uh, put into print uh, maybe like a day or two before he left from Joplin to come here. And so I'm going to be gleaning uh, some from that little book Forever Faithful um, but I wasn't really necessarily going to preach on faithfulness um, uh, up until last weekend when I heard uh, his messages. And in the last few days, God has just directed my heart towards the subject of faithfulness um, and its importance. And so again today, and Lord willing, for a few weeks, I will be directing our attention to the faithfulness of God. Later, Lord willing, I will direct our attention to the need 
for our own personal faithfulness to God and our faithfulness to others in the things that we do and the things that we don't do. One thing for sure is God's faithfulness is something that we can all celebrate. And one thing for sure as well, I guess that'd be two things, but another thing for sure is that we are living in perilous times. We are living in a literal sewer of unfaithfulness. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, you know, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. See, see if this sounds like our culture at all. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will even act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Paul says to Timothy, stay away from people like that. The thing that was pressed upon my heart this weekend as Victor spoke was that the kingdom of God needs Christians who are consistently faithful. They are faithful to their spouses, faithful to their Savior Jesus Christ, faithful to Christ's church, the blood-bought body of Christ. In, uh, in Victor's book, this is one of the things that I gleaned out of his book. He, he, in his book it says, Life Innovations recently released the following information on the status of marriage in the United States. Married households are barely above 50%. There is less than a 50% chance that couples currently married will reach their 25th anniversary. Couples separate on average seven years after marriage and divorce after eight. Now, writing in the Lookout magazine uh, 15 years ago, Bob Russell, another man that I have high respect for, he said... Some youth leaders estimate that 90% of Christian teenagers who go off to secular college are lost to the church within three months. The students may still claim to be a Christian and visit church when they return home, but realistically they are no longer identified with Christ by belief, or behavior. And in the book Falling Away, Why Christians Lose Their Faith and What Can Be Done About It, Brian Simmons writes that approximately half of all people in the churches of Christ fall away between their 18th and 25th birthday. Unfaithfulness is a serious problem in any generation. Are you aware that the Bible says the following of King Saul? So Saul died for his unfaithfulness. Recorded in 1 Chronicles 10.13, Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he committed against the Lord, because of the word of the Lord which he did not keep. Also, because he asked counsel of a medium, making inquiry of her, and did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. I think, what a warning! Well, what a warning to heed! We, we owe it to God, our Savior, to live differently. Story is told of the college student who walked into a photography studio with a framed picture of his girlfriend. 
He wanted the picture duplicated. Well, that involved removing it from the frame. And in doing this, the studio owner noticed the inscription on the back of the photograph, My dearest Tom, I love you with all my heart. I love you more and more each day. I will love you forever and ever. I am yours for all eternity. It was signed, Diane, and it contained a P.S. If we ever break up, I want this picture back. In contrast to all this unfaithfulness and distrust, in contrast to that is a God who is so faithful. A God is so faithful. It is that reality that I want us to celebrate and embrace today and probably for a few weeks. It's not a truth to be heard and forgotten, but one that we need to be reminded of constantly. Our God is a faithful God. and We can trust Him. King Saul is a microcosm of man, and man is a, is a polar opposite of God. And 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. However, our unfaithfulness does not negate God's faithfulness. Referencing the children of Israel, Paul said, In Romans 3, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. By no means. God is faithful. If you're in the audience and you like a lot of Scripture, you're going to love this message. Because I got a bunch of Scripture today. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10 says, No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind, and God is faithful. So He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Repeatedly, Scripture refers to God as being faithful. Notice how Moses chose to describe God after he gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. He said in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His faithfulness to a thousand generations for those who love Him and keep His commandments. The Song of Moses includes this stanza in Deuteronomy 32, 4, The Rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are just, a God of faithfulness, and without injustice, righteousness, and just is He. David's song of praise in Psalm 18.25, With the faithful you show yourself faithful, with the blameless you prove yourself, yourself blameless. You know, God is under no obligation to show Himself faithful to those who are faithless. But perhaps the greatest exaltation of God's faithfulness is found in Lamentations, where Jeremiah writes, The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end. Are we thankful for that? His... his, uh, His acts of mercy do not end, for His compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I don't know if that's the verse that uh, inspired the hymn writer, but the hymn writer wrote those words. Kayleen sang this song last Saturday night at the missions banquet. Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not, Thy compassions they fail not. As Thou hast seen, Thou forever will be. I was going to sing that to you, but then it dawned on me, Kayleen just sang it, and uh, my version would be lots worse than hers. The point is, God is always faithful. 
God is always and absolutely faithful. And I want to tell you on a personal level that I don't believe that God has ever let me down. I can't think of a time when God has not been there for me. He's always given me exactly what I needed. When I needed it. Whether it was provision or correction, because I have needed both. I especially see His hand as He's carried me through 28 years of full-time ministry. He's been by my side day in and day out. Certainly there have been high points. Certainly there have been low points. Certainly there have been successes. Certainly there have been failures. But either way, God is faithful. Aren't you glad that God's not a politician? God's not a politician. God always keeps His promises. I'm going to give you uh, quite a few psalms. Listen to the psalmist as he praises God over and over and over for His faithfulness. Psalm 36, 5, Your mercy, Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 57, 10, For your goodness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, God. May your glory be above all the earth. Psalm 89, 1, I will sing of the graciousness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make your faithfulness known with my mouth. For I have said graciousness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. Psalm 91, 4, He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. The faithfulness of God continues to reach all generations, and aren't you glad it does? Aren't you glad His faithfulness reaches to all generations? Psalm 100 says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness or jubilation. Come before Him with rejoicing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. For we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courtyards with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His faithfulness is to all generations. It's no wonder that David declared, I have chosen the faithful way, I have placed your judgments before me. My question is, have you chosen the way of faithfulness? Have you chosen the way of faithfulness? You see, even our faith is based upon God's faithfulness. Hebrews 11.11 says, By faith even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. I think the faithfulness of God is the bedrock of the Bible. I think it, it, it's literally the foundation of all Scripture. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful, though through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The one who calls is faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is He who calls you, and He also will do it. And so based on all this, we should fully commit our lives to Him because after all, He is our faithful Creator. 
Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So if you can't trust God, who can you trust? So what does it mean to be faithful? When you think about being faithful, what comes to your mind? You probably think of things like steadfast, being steadfast and dedicated and dependable, worthy of trust. And if you think those things, then you were right on track. Because the Hebrew word, which the words translated faithful and faithfulness in the Old Testament are derived, means to prop or to stay or to support. When applied to individuals, it means someone a person can safely lean upon. So if you need someone to lean upon, looking for someone who is faithful, someone you can lean upon. The Greek word used in the New Testament means trustworthy or to be relied upon. So faithfulness has to do with being trustworthy and loyal. The faithful person is steadfast. Are you steadfast? The faithful person is unchanging. The faithful person is thoroughly grounded in relation to the other. This sort of fidelity or faithfulness is used in both the Old and New Testaments to describe God's relation to the world and to describe the quality of relationship that Israel and Christians are called upon to have with God and with one another. So how do we know that God is faithful? Well, I've tried to establish the Bible tells us He's faithful. The Bible tells us that He is. I have shared text after text after text describing the faithfulness of God. The Old Testament certainly says this clearly. Let me share one more verse from the Old Testament. I I read the first couple of verses of Psalm 89. But I will sing of the graciousness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make your faithfulness known with my mouth. For I have said graciousness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build up your throne to all generations. The heavens will praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of Of the Holy Ones. And speaking of the assembly, don't forget about Hebrews 10 23 through 25 from our New Testament, written to Christians, saying, Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is who promised is faithful. And let's consider how to encourage one another. How many have worked at encouraging someone today? That's the purpose of our gathering, by the way. Consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our own meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I hope you've been able to be encouraged or be an encourager, pointing people to the faithful one, Jesus Christ. Encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I don't know, I, I kind of think the day is drawing near. Well, we're in the last days. Of course, we've been in the last days since the cross, since the crucifixion of Christ. We've been in the last days, but it, it seems like we're in the latter parts of the last days. I, I don't know that. Nobody knows. But I do know that people need to be encouraged in these last days. You can have a great ministry of encouragement by being together, encouraging one another. The proclamation of this truth is designed to give the people of God hope and comfort. Is it working? Is it working this morning? Maybe not. Maybe so. I have no idea from the reaction from the crowd. You're either getting it or you're not. So we know that God is faithful because the Bible says so. But we also know that he is faithful because, well, that is his track record. God has made many promises, and he has kept every single one of them. 
Find me a promise that he hasn't kept from the scripture. I'll eat the page it's written on. He's kept every single one of his promises. More than 4,000 years ago, God promised in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. And every year that comes furnishes a fresh witness to God's fulfillment of this promise. In Genesis 15, 13, God promised Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. And as you know or may not know, the, the centuries ran their weary course, and Abraham's descendants groaned amid the brick kilns of Egypt. Had God forgotten his promise? Had God forgotten them? By no means. Exodus 12 tells us the rest of the story, beginning in verse 31. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in a hurry, for they said, We will all be dead. Verse 35, Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And verse 40, Now the time that the sons of Israel had lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years, on this very day, all the multitudes of the Lord departed from the land of Egypt. And as you may or may not know, they miraculously crossed the Red Sea. And then, because of their distrust and disobedience, they found themselves wandering in the desert for 40 years. Now, keep in mind that this was no small group of people. We are told that 600,000 men, besides women and children, came out of Egypt. A conservative estimate might be around 3 million people. Hmm. Where were 3 million people going to get what they needed to survive in the desert? Walmart? <laughs> Can you imagine 3 million in the self-checkout line? So many people without necessary food and drink. A truly desperate situation. But you know what God did for the Israelites? He faithfully provided for them. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 through 4 says it like this. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. I wish my daughter's feet didn't swell. <laughs> What's that? Grow, grow, that's what I mean, grow. I'm just saying, Ash, I'm just saying that it would be nice not to have buy, buy shoes every month. That's, that's what I'm saying. See, they, they didn't need... <laughs> They didn't need clothes or shoes for 40 years because God provided them with what they needed. So, anyway, no shoes for the next 40 years. I'm kidding. But do you see God's faithfulness to this 
conservative number of three million people. God faithfully provided for them. Not for days, not for weeks, not for months, but God faithfully provided for 40 years. And after that, as you remember, God brought them into the land of promise, established them as a nation. And then, because of their continual disobedience, allowed another nation to destroy them. And it's in the context, it is in that context that we find our scripture from Lamentations 3 that I used with my sermon title. I don't know if you've read the book of Lamentations or not, but I'll tell you, it's not a happy book. It's, it's not a happy book. The, the nation of Israel has been invaded and is now controlled by a foreign power. Jerusalem, as chapter 1 and verse 1 says, how lonely sits the city that once had many people. She has become like a widow who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. It's a, it's a bleak scene. It's not happy. It's a very bleak scene. Here we have the picture of, of God's people who are in real trouble, and yet we are also given the picture of a God who, though He disciplines still has a great love for his people. But as Jeremiah laments what has happened to the Israelites, and he also encourages them to lament. Chapter 2, verse 18. Their heart cried out to the Lord, You wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears stream down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Let your eyes have no rest. In fact, as we read in the beginning of chapter 3, Jeremiah is black with depression. He's in a depressed spot. He's gloomy at this point. And he says in verse 1, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. And as he continues that lament all through chapter 3, and praise the Lord, we finally get to verse 21. I recall this to my mind. Therefore I wait. The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for His compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In Jeremiah's mind, there was still a ray of hope. And this ray of hope was in the Lord. It was in His unfailing love and His mercies. This is what Jeremiah embraced in those dark days. This is what he remembered when all seemed lost and hopeless. He remembered the unfailing love of God. He remembered that great is his faithfulness. What do you remember when all seems lost? What do you remember when all things seem bad, when things don't go your way? It's this faithfulness of God that I want us to celebrate and embrace this morning as we continue in this series of lessons. Are you going through any situation as dark as Jeremiah? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Are you going through any situation as dark as Jeremiah and the Israelites? Do you got any rivers that are impossible to cross? Do you have any mountains too difficult to climb? Well, don't worry, because God specializes in impossible situations. God will faithfully carry us through. We can count on it, but we must not ever give up on Him. In Acts 27, Paul and a boatload of people found themselves in a terrible storm. Paul received a message from the Lord that all would be safe. It all looked like they were going to perish, but all would be safe as long as they stayed with the boat. Read that in Acts 27. God will surely carry us through the storms. 
You can count on it. But he can only carry you if you don't abandon ship. God is faithful. And if we haven't learned it as of yet, then it is one we need to learn. But it is one thing to accept the faithfulness of God as the divine truth. It's a whole nother ball game to act upon it. I hope and pray that we can find the faith and courage to place our trust in a very trustworthy God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, God, thank you for your faithfulness. And as you look into our hearts, God, I pray that you'd find us faithful. God, I pray for every soul in the room. I pray as they are examining themselves right now, because it does no good to examine someone else. It does no good to hope that someone else heard this message. We need to examine our own hearts. And so, God, as we examine our hearts, as you look into our hearts, God, may you find us faithful. And God, if there's something that we need to leave at the foot of the cross this morning, I pray that we would do it. And God, I pray that each one of us, if there's a decision that we need to make, some decisions are private, some are public, God, I pray that you would prick our heart, cause us to do whatever it takes to be right with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you be standing, please, as we sing our hymn of invitation. If there's anyone there out there this morning who needs to get right with the Lord, then please come forward this morning as we sing this song of invitation. On bended knee I come with a humble heart God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. My house to your house. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen. All right. Let's have a word of prayer this morning, and then we'll close with great is the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just being in this place with us this morning. Thank you for each heart here, and just thank you, Father, that we can come together as brothers and sisters and be encouraged through you. Just pray that as we go to our homes this week and as we celebrate together uh, just a time of thanksgiving that we would just acknowledge you, Father, that each and every good thing in our life comes from you. We just thank you for that promise. And bless us now as we go from this place. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Great is the Lord, and he is holy and just. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, 
by his mercy he proves his love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is the lord and worthy of praise great is the lord now lift up your voice now lift up your voice blessed week. Enjoy your time.